It's October, so that means spooky month. Ooh. Which means we gotta do something spooky related in PCG as well. And check this out. Hey, it's a classic spooky hallway where the lights turn on as you continue walking and turn off behind you. Additionally, with flickering lights. So you can have your very simple and quite easy to set up spooky experience for your game and create this hallway for yourself using PCG. So with that out of the way, let me show it's done. To get started, we of course need to enable our plugins. So go to edit plugins and search PCG. And you want to make sure that PCG procedure contribution is turned on. Hit yes. As well as the instanced actors interrupt here, which is experimental. You want to enable that as well. Hit yes and restart your engine. When you restart, you might get this error, which is asset manager settings do not include an entry for assets of time game feature data, which is required for game feature plugins to function. You can just click this add entry to primary asset types, click it and it'll say made the changes that I needed to. And then you can go ahead and close out of here. And now we can get started with the actual graph and everything. Let's start by right clicking, going to PCG and grab ourselves a PCG graph. We're going to create an empty graph. This is going to be our PCG spooky hallway. We're also going to right click and go to blueprint class and grab ourselves an actor class. And this is going to be our BP underscore spooky hallway. Once you have that, open up the blueprint. And here we're just going to add a component of a spline, regular spline component. I'm just going to drag it out a little bit further for convenience. And we're going to add a PCG component and then in the detail panel, we're going to add the graph in that we just made. And that's all we really need here. At this point, I can just drag out this graph right into the world and extend it as I need to. We'll just go ahead and position it kind of somewhere around here and just make it nice and long. And now let's go ahead and open up the PCG graph. PCG graph is going to be relatively simple. All we're going to do is right click and search for get spline data because we're going to get the information of the spline. And then we need to get a spline sampler. Now this spline sampler should be the length of your mesh. So in my case, I'm using this mesh right here. Now looking at it, it is X is the length here. And so I'm looking at the approximate site 750 units here in the top left. So I know that the spline sampler needs to be 750 units. So back in the PCG graph, we're going to change on spline subdivision to distance of a distance of 750. And then from here, we can use a simple static mesh spawner with a mesh entry of this mesh, just like so. So already we have this pathway here. What I'm going to do is just reposition the player start all the way to the start here. So if I hit play, you can see there I am. And while I'm here, I'm also going to add some collisions in here just really simply. So on this mesh itself, if I hit the eye icon here, I can show simple collision. And you can see it is a mess. This would not work if we actually enabled this collision to be used. So what I'm going to do is go to collision, remove collision, and I'm going to collision, add box, simplify collision, which is going to get us a box around the entire thing, which we don't want. Instead, I'm going to take this box and I'm going to move it over and scale it and basically position this box where it just blocks off enough of this wall. And I'm going to hold alt and drag it out and put a wall on the other side. So basically we're going to be stuck in between these two walls. We're probably also going to need a floor. So I'm going to hold alt and again, make another copy and then rotate this 90 degrees and then bring it up until we're pretty much at the floor level. So finally, we have made a very simple U shaped collision here. And then back in the PCG graph, we can scroll down instead of no collision. We can go ahead and select lock all. But what we actually want to do is turn off the camera collision. So we're going to go custom afterwards and just turn on ignore for camera. If I hit play, I cannot move past this room. I can go in and I can go down, but I can go side to side very easily and the camera does not get clipped. So perfect. So we can now see it as a side scroller. Now this is for a third person camera. I actually want to zoom in a little bit here. Let's go ahead and customize kind of the visual aspect of it first. So I'm going to go to the third person character, the blueprint and open it up. If you're using your own custom character, of course, customize it in whatever blueprint that is. I'm going to select the camera boom arm. I'm going to change the target length on it. Something like 250 maybe. And now we can see that is taking up the correct area of the screen that I'd want. It is just this area. Okay, good. Next thing I want to do is kind of change the brightness and the controls for that. So let's go ahead and select the directional light. I'm actually going to kill the entire thing. I'm going to set the intensity all the way to zero. I'm going to select the skylight, turn off a real-time capture and select specified cube map. I'm going to give this daylight cube map, which is going to make it brighter, of course, but it is evenly lit. And the only thing left to do is adjust, of course, the brightness because it's auto exposing still. So I'm going to add something, which is the post process volume. In the detail panel, I'm going to search for unbounded. So that way I can make it affect everything. And then I'm going to go under exposure, turn the metering mode to manual and the exposure compensation to 
10. And you can see it is now spooky. It is now nicely evenly lit, but we still get enough light even in the dark areas where you can kind of see what's going on. So this is a good starting point where we can start adding lights and having those turn on and flicker and everything we need to do. So how do we tell where these lights go? Very simply, because we're using a static mesh, we can just add sockets where we want to put the lights. So in your static mesh, in the top right, you'll see socket manager. Go ahead and select it. If you don't see it, go to window socket manager and have it enabled. And so we need to add a socket. I'll go ahead and hit the plus button here. And then I'm going to position this socket pretty much right underneath this light. And then with it still selected, I'm going to open up the advanced tab here and we give it a tag. This is just going to be a tag of light. And then I'm going to hold alt and make a copy of it. Put it over here under this one, hold alt and move it over to the right one. Now I have three sockets, all with a light tag and all roughly where it needs to be. Great. So let's go ahead and get started with those. Back to the PCG graph, we can make use of them. I want to attach them to the static mesh here. So from the static mesh spawner on the out attribute name, I'm going to save the mesh as an attribute by putting in mesh here. And that is going to be the name of the attribute we save. And what we want to do is drag out of here and search get attribute from point index, which will get us the attribute of this mesh because it is last. This will automatically get the mesh attribute because the last thing we do is set this mesh attribute. You can see if I press A here, it says mesh and there's our information of our actual static mesh. If you are doing things in between here for your project, you can always put in specifically mesh into the input source and then you'll guarantee that you get the mesh attribute from here. So great, we have the actual mesh that we are using. So now we need to get the sockets from it. To do that, right click, search for execute blueprint and in the top right in the drop down, just search socket. You'll get mesh sockets to points. Now this takes a static mesh input and a tag. The tag of course is light and the static mesh we're just gonna use as an input. So we're gonna open it up. Attribute goes into static mesh and we can close this back up. This will actually put it at origin. All of these points at the current moment exist at origin based on the mesh that we grab. They're not actually at the location that these are spawned. So what we wanna do is copy them from one location to the other using our copy points. We're gonna copy the sockets that we just created. That is gonna go into our source and we're gonna copy them back to the location that we spawned in the static mesh spawner as our target. If I go ahead and debug this, you will see a small little cube next to all of these lights. That's how you know you've done it successfully. We have a small debug cube. If you wanna see it bigger, just change the extents here on the scale method to absolute. And now you can see there's all of them nice and big. So great, so we now have all of the locations. So now we wanna spawn the light. The light we're gonna have a lot of controls for, we want it to actually flicker. So for that, I'm gonna create a blueprint actor that holds the light and we're gonna add the customization of it to be able to flicker. So in the content browser, I'm gonna right click, go to blueprint class and grab ourselves another actor. That's going to be our BP flickering light and open it up. This is gonna be relatively simple. All I'm gonna do is add a spotlight. I'm gonna angle it downwards because we don't actually want it to face sideways. And then in the detail section for it, I'm gonna search for IES. And I wanna put in IES texture, which is a light profile from real world measurement data. So it basically makes it more realistic. And thankfully there are some already built into Unreal by default. If you do not see these, make sure under settings here, you have engine and plugin content enabled. So I'm gonna use this complex IES, which looks pretty nice. And I'm also gonna turn on use IES intensity, which means it will use the intensity stored on this profile to make it even more accurate. If I was to take this light already and just drag it out, you can see that is the result of our light. It looks pretty nice. It has a nice fall off here. Yeah, that looks pretty good for us. Let's go with this. So let's make it flicker. Go to the event graph. We don't need anything except the event begin play. And I want it to flicker randomly. So what we're gonna do is have a chance of it starting to flicker and then the actual flickering. And then again, a delay and then another chance to flicker. So I'm gonna start with a random float. And basically I'm gonna say, what is the chance that I want it to flicker? So in my case, I'm gonna say greater than 0.5. Random float is between zero and one. So this will give it a 50% chance of flickering. Something like a 0.8 will give it a 20% chance. 0.2 is an 80% chance. So you can customize this to your needs. I'll say 50% chance. And then if it is successful, then go ahead and continue. Now let's go ahead and set up the actual flickering. So I'm gonna drag out and search for timeline. We're gonna add a timeline here and then we're gonna open it up. Now, instead of a length of five, I'm gonna change it to be a length of one. So it's gonna be a very short flicker. And I hit add a float track. And so what I wanna do here is tell it to effectively randomize its intensity. So I'm gonna right click and search for add key to curve float. The time is gonna be zero, but the value is gonna be one. I'm gonna add another key of a time one and a value of one. So right now we have just a value of one to one. So that way it is on by default. It will do something and it will return to one. So that's why I'm having the first and the last point be one. And now we can do randomness in between. So all we need to do is just right click, 
like add a key and just continue adding a key. So something random like this, I think will be fine. And then all I'm going to do is select all of them and then press one, which will make it nice and curved. What is one? Well, if I have any of them selected and right click on that point, you can see it is the key interpolation. I'm saying setting it to be auto. It was all unlinear previously. That just gives it a nicer gradient here. I'm also going to right click on this new track zero and rename it to just light intensity. And now we can go back to the event graph and start using this timeline. To use this light intensity, we're just going to grab our spotlight, drag it out, and then drag out and set IES intensity scale. That's the one we want. Because we've set it to use IES intensity scale here, it will no longer use the default intensity of the light. Neither the units nor the intensity values, you see they're both grayed out. You can use one or the other, up to you which one you use. If you're going to be using the regular instead of the IES, just set the intensity instead of setting the IES intensity. So just take this light intensity, plug this into the new value, and the update goes into here. So once it does this flickering, once it's finished, we want to pause for a moment. So from here, I'm just going to drag out and search for delay. And again, I want to delay for a random amount. So I'm going to right click, search for random float in range, and I want it to delay anywhere from zero to five seconds. The reason I want zero is because I want it to potentially flicker longer than a second at any point. And if the duration is, let's say, 0.1 or 0.2 or something less than a second, it might look like it's just continuing to flicker. So we're going to plug that all the way through. And then after this delay, we want to start again. So we'll just drag this all the way back to the branch at the very beginning to have a chance of flickering again. Let's go ahead and reroute this and then we're good. But at the current moment, if it fails, it doesn't do anything. So instead, if it fails this check, I want it to do with the delay. And after the delay, try again. So basically 50% chance if it fails, wait zero to five seconds and try again. If it succeeds, do the timeline and else go ahead and reset back. So that's all we need here. If I go ahead and once again, take our flickering blueprint and just drag it out here and then press Alt S to simulate, you will see that, okay, nothing's flickering. And there it goes. There's the flicker and then it stops, but it never flickers a second time. The reason it never flickers a second time is because we're using just regular play. In this timeline, we need to make sure that it's always play from the start every time. Otherwise, it, the timeline is already at the end and so it doesn't re-flicker itself. So if I change it to be flicker from start and now I hit simulate, there it is flickering. So it just flickered, but every time again, it will have another chance to flicker again. And there it goes flickering again. So there we go. So that's how we now have it randomly flickering. So fantastic. We got our nice flickering light. Last thing we need to do here is actually set these lights up to spawn here and then turn on and off based on the distance. And that's where the instance actors interrupt comes in. So from this copy point, I'm going to drag out and search for spawn instance actors. That throws an error because we haven't plugged anything into it. And here in the actor class, I'm going to plug in our flickering light. Now, immediately you're going to get a warning. Don't close this immediately. At the very least, make a note of this name, which will be your blueprint name and with an underscore C. And it says it doesn't have a matching class or super class entry in the actor class settings registry. So we need to add this and then it'll be happy. So how do we do this? Well, for that, in the content browser, just right click, go to miscellaneous and go to data registry is the one right next to the miscellaneous word. And we want to grab the regular data registry. Go ahead, select and I'll call this DR underscore spooky hallway. And then let's open up the DR spooky hallway. You're going to get this registry preview. We need to put in a few things here. For the item struct, if I select in the drop down, if I search for instanced actor, you will see here instanced actors class settings. That is the one we want. Instance actors class settings. And then what you want to do is take this entire it exactly to the registry type exactly as it is here instanced actors plural class settings plural again if you make a typo it's not going to break everything but it also will not work so if you down the line find that it is not working check the spelling that is a common place where i've messed up at this point we need to add a data source so just hit the plus on the array here and we could specify what kind of data source personally i find the data table source to be quite nice so i'll go ahead and select that and then open it up and it wants to specify a data table we don't have have one. So what I'm going to do in the drop down is just select data table and it's going to ask us where do you want to save it. I'll put it in the tutorial folder and call this DT underscore spooky hallway and hit save. For the row structure, as you might have guessed, it is the same thing as the other ones, instance actors class settings. Then go ahead and hit OK and we can open it up and then you get this. In my case, I have the data table on the left and the row editor on the right. Your row editor might be down below, but that's OK. This is just a difference in layout. All we need to do here is hit add here to add a new row to the data table and the main thing is this row name right here. This row name is what you got in the message log. BP underscore flickering light underscore C. Everything here has to go into the row name. So I'm going to double click on new row and then go to BP underscore flickering light underscore C. And then we can go into the row editor and actually customize some things. In my case, I want to change the max actor distance.
distance. I'm going to drop it from 1,000 to 400. Now, what is the max actor distance? Basically, at what point does it become an actual actor in the world? Until that point, it is just effectively an instant static mesh where it just has instances of those meshes that exist in the world. So if you were to have a lamp with a light on it, the lamp would be visible because it is a mesh, but the light would be disabled until you actually got close enough for it. In this case, within 400 units of it, and then the light would turn on because it would become a blueprint in the world. In our case, we don't spawn the actual lamp because it's built into the mesh, but you can absolutely, in your blueprint here, have a static mesh that has the light in here, and it will automatically spawn the static mesh. It will always be visible, but the light will still only turn on when you get in range. You'll see what I mean in just a moment with it getting in range. But once we have all of this set up, we need to actually edit to the registry. To do that, go to Edit Project Settings, and here under Game Data Registry, you want to add directories to scan. Go ahead, plus, and then in the first index or whichever index you have here, hit the three dots. And in my case, they're in the tutorial folder, so I'll select that. It does not work in the root content folder slash game only, but you shouldn't be putting your stuff there anyways. But I just figured I'd let you know in case you're doing a test and you just put it there, it will not work. Put it into a folder and then no problems. Once you have this in here, you could check that everything works by going back to your PCG graph and clicking force region. If once you hit force region, the warnings do not pop up again. Congratulations, you've done everything correctly. So now if I hit play, you will see I have a light right next to me. And if I continue forward, I will get these lights to turn on as I kind of move forward. Now I can move a little bit forward and back here, which makes it a little bit difficult to control the distance. So what I'm going to do is just come back to our setup here. And I'm just going to make it so I have a little bit less movement room here. And now if you take a look, you can see, hey, that looks pretty good. Now I'm very fast, which does not look spooky at all. So for our final thing, I want to go into our character, make sure the self is selected and then search for walk speed. I'm going to change the walk speed from 600 to something like 200. And now we're a little bit slower. And as we kind of get closer, it goes ahead and turns on the lights. Now, if I wanted to affect from further away, we can go back to the data table, select our flickering light and change this max actor distance to be something like 500. And now you can see it is turning on a little bit earlier. So we could see it turn on before we kind of get nearly as close to it. And of course it turns off behind us, very spooky. And if we go another way, it doesn't matter which way it is entirely based on the distance from the character. And the lights, of course, flicker. As we walk around, they will occasionally flicker either at the very beginning or after a moment, all completely randomly. So that's how you make a very simple spooky hallway using P CG to spawn it all and control all of the lights dynamically turn on and off where you need it. If you want to recreate this for yourself, I will be leaving the link to this environment that I grabbed on Sketchfab down in the description below. Or if you want to download this entire project for yourself, it'll be available on my Patreon where you can join these wonderful people here in supporting what I do. It really means a lot. If you'd like to join the community, the link to the Discord will be down below as always. If you're looking to learn more about instance actors and how powerful and useful they are, check out this video right over here. You're going to your learning journey.